uh, I'm Donna Woods, if you haven't met me before, and we do a bi-weekly webinar where we feature special guests. Um, through our business, we have uh, been blessed by being able to travel the world and meet some pretty incredible people that are uh, doing their part to help change the world. And so uh, I've, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. And so with the COVID situation that has kind of brought everything to the forefront. And so um, our series is called Health Made Simple. And today's guest is Scott Purdom of Advantage Horsemanship. And Scott has partnered with Nathan Gist. Yay, she got it. Yay! <laughs> and we met Scott in at Belmont Park. Was it Belmont Park? Belmont 10 years ago in New York. No, was it there? Or I thought it, it was Illinois. It was. Or it could have been the Illinois Horse Fair and that would have been 11 years ago. Okay, can we not talk about that far back? It's, I'm feeling really <laughs> old right now. I know, it was before you had kids. And I was listening oh. to your podcast, yes, podcast yesterday. And I was like, oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> where, where did time go, right? Yeah, wow. I'm going to go cry now because I realize how old I am. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, and it's been an interesting journey for us as well, Scott, as for you. Like we've watched your business learn and grow and evolve and, and you know, we've kind of bounced in and out of each other's paths um, over the years. And so we're super excited that we're reconnected with you. Yeah, and hopefully here to stay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, today, Scott and Nathan are going to be talking about a topic um, and this is this is going to be related to horses but really not because fear is is if you're human and you're alive you experience fear and so it's a matter of what do you do with that fear and how do you move through it and do you let it uh, program you into a different habit or do you just kind of acknowledge it and move through it and um, and go on? And so um, I'm super excited to have them chat today because I think they're going to talk specifically about um, fear with horses and fear with riding. And I have had um, some experiences with my own horses where I have gotten injured and that's never a fun thing. And um, as I've gotten older, <laughs> it hurts more when you get hurt. And so, um, and so it's one of those things that I have struggled with and worked to overcome. And so I thought it was a great, great topic for Scott and Nathan to chat about today because Scott, um, I know that you, um, Prior to COVID, you had done some in-person workshops with horses and riders, and Nathan, you were a huge part of that program as well, and getting tremendous results. I think like when you and I chatted, you had shared that people that were afraid to canter, like during your program, like they're behind you cantering, and you're like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. So, it was amazing to watch. Yeah. So I am going to be quiet and I'm going to turn it over to you too. But before we do that, um, what we're going to do for everybody out there is if you have any questions, please type them into the chat. We're going to give the floor to Nathan and Scott for the next 30 to 40 minutes. And then what they'll do is we're going to allow the last 15 to 20 minutes um, for Q&A. And if something comes up or if somebody has an experience or something that is really relevant to the conversation in that moment, please type it up in the chat. I will be watching the chat and we have other uh, team members watching the chat as well so that if we feel like we need to um, kind of let Scott and Nathan um, field that because um, it'll enhance the conversation, we'll certainly do that. And so, gentlemen, 
welcome. Could you Thank please you. just, um, Scott, we're going to start with you because that, I mean, I just met Nathan five minutes ago. Um, and you guys became best friends like super fast. I was really, I know. it was really weird watching it to be, <laughs> to be totally honest from you, with you. <laughs> well, for anybody that knows me, they know that I am a geek for learning and especially on cellular programming, habits, belief systems, how the brain works, all of that. I just, it's just like my deal. I just love that. So sorry. <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> no, no it's, a, it's an awesome thing to geek out on. But first off, I want to I wanna thank you, Donna, for putting this on and Photonic Health overall for putting this on. Both Nathan and I are uh, very excited to, to be here today. That's for darn sure. Um, one of the first, as we talk about, obviously, this is going to be about fears, anxieties, confidence in the saddle. Um, this is going to be kind of a two-part conversation overall. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to separate it in a way that Nathan is going to be kind of talking about the human mind uh, and how to really start to achieve what's important um, to, to be able to overcome these fears and anxieties, and not just in the saddle, right? I mean, Donna was talking about fears, uh, you know, that we have in life, but really it's not just fears, it's anxieties too. I mean, you know, we are all plagued with anxieties, you know, at some point in time in our life. And I think it's important that we really try to focus our mind and understanding how to get over it. And as Nathan's going to be talking about in the future, or, you know, in a little bit, it's going to be talking about how powerful our mind really is. And I think it's going to be, you know, really great for you guys to really focus in on that. But my side, what I'm going to be talking about is kind of the body, the, the, the structure system, the piece of the puzzle that is also just as important as the mind, but really they both are going to go together. I'm going to be talking about how to get you to stabilize your seat in the saddle to really get that not only connection, but really feel that, you know, if you all have been in the saddle, I'm sure from time to time, you might feel that kind of waving left or right, or like you, you feel like you're going to fall off at some point in time. And so what we're going to talk about is how to stabilize your seat uh, in the saddle and how to get it literally within 30 seconds. So I'm really excited about talking about that. But before I do, uh, I'm sure some of you don't uh, know who I am. I wanted to just kind of not only just talk about me for just a second, but I wanted to share my story about fear because one of the things that I, I think when I talk about fear, I sometimes, because I'm a clinician in the horse world that, you know, I go all, all over the country teaching people, people seem to think that I don't hold any fear. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. And so what I want to talk about, I wanted to share a story with you that really changed my life forever with horses. And, and then we'll, I'll turn it over to Nathan here in just a second. But when I was really young starting out, this was when I got out of uh, college, I went and I, was, uh, I interned with a gentleman in West Virginia, and he was a, a really great hand with a horse. I was super excited to learn from him. And I was there and he gave me a lot of opportunities to ride. I got on, a, this all happened kind of uh, um, in, you know, the, the worst things that could happen. It all happened all at once like this. I got on this horse that was an unbroke. He had only had about two or three rides on him. I decided to ride him by myself. Uh, in a round pen. Nobody was on the farm whatsoever. Now, let me kind of set the scene. I was 18 years old. I was a little, um, what could I say, or how could I say, egotistical. <laughs> and just maybe a little bit. And so I was, uh, uh, I was on this horse, and he was, a, like I said, a two-year-old. I'm riding around in this round pen. I thought I was the best thing since sliced bread, okay? And I'm riding this horse around, and all of a sudden, as I'm loping around, the horse trips and falls to his knees. And when he falls to his knees, I, um, uh, I rode that out just fine. But in the process of him falling to his knees, he scared himself, got back up and started bucking. Now, being young, egotistical, stupid maybe, I was riding this horse out, bucking around the round pen, one full lap, I'm riding it pretty good. Second full lap, still bucking, still riding it pretty good. Again, egotistical. So with that in mind, as I am uh, 
uh, going around in this circle, the horse did something that I wasn't ready for. He figured out how to take that girth and suck his belly up. So the girth then became super loose. And within a matter of moments, I, st I realized that. And then my whole process went to thinking, which round pen panel am I going to fall off on? I picked one. I came off. Being that young, being that e egotistical, I, at the same time, instead of being fearful, I got angry. To make a long story short, the saddle went underneath the belly. I got the horse stopped. I tightened, uh, you know, fixed it, tightened the cinch up. I said, if you can breathe, then you're lucky. I tightened it that, that <laughs> far up. I ran him into the ground and I said, you know, you, how dare you do this to me? This was before I knew better. And as I'm doing this, I, I lunged him for maybe another 10, 15 minutes, got back on and I just went and I went right back off into a lope. And I said, you lope. You know what he did? He went right back into that buck. And in, even with as tight as I had that saddle, he figured out how to suck his belly up within a matter of moments. And the ironic part of this was that I came off a second time on the same exact round pen panel, two times within 10, about 15 minutes. And after I got up, dusted myself off, fixed the saddle, my hands were shaken. I instantly went into fear and I fixed the saddle kind of lunged the horse again, tried to get up on, I could feel the tension in the horse. And from that point forward, I walked and I trotted. I did not canter. He didn't buck again, but I got scared. So I did what any idiot would do was I bought the horse. <laughs> <laughs> Something I do not recommend to, to, to anyone. But the reason I bought the horse was I said, I know the career path that I want to go down. I am afraid. And how could I ever get to a place of saying that I can teach people to overcome fear if I can't overcome it myself? So with that story being said, it took me six months to a year, but that horse is still with me today. He's the best horse I have, and he's going to be with me till the day that he dies. And he, it, it's, it was just an amazing opportunity because he is the one who made me who I am today. So I too experienced that fear. But one of the things we're going to be talking about, the one thing people ask me all the time, how did you get over it? And for me, one of the things we'll talk even farther in depth about is I actually use that fear to my benefit. And I'll leave that as a cliffhanger for the future because we'll be talking about that as well. Let me turn it over to Nathan uh, to talk a little bit about himself. Nathan? Right. So since we were talking about egotistical, I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know what? Um, it, it is. It's that, it's that odd moment where you're like, okay, now what do I say? Uh, so a couple of things, and this is why Donna and I were starting to geek out a little bit in the beginning, is uh, so I'm a hypnotherapist. I'm also a confidence coach. Uh, and a big part of what I do is I help people to recognize that they're far more than the story they have in their own mind. See, one thing we gotta get is that we have a conscious mind and an unconscious mind. And that conscious mind, it's critical thinking, it's problem solving, it's very analytical. And that unconscious mind, that subconscious, it's, it's emotion and it's tied to behavior. And we'll touch a little bit more. Is that just me or did Nathan go Nathan, out? Nathan just froze up. Are you there, uh -oh. Nathan? Ah, yes. Can you see me? Yep, now we can see you. Awesome. Okay. So Nathan, how did how did you get to hypnotherapy? How did you get to being a confidence coach? Because like, you know, I'm not gonna age any of us, but <laughs> like, you know, even think. 10 years ago, there was no such thing as confidence coaches. Yeah. So um, yeah. How, how, what, like, what was your journey to getting there? Because I think it's super important, like, you know, we all have a story, right? Very true. And so I've, I've always admired people like Jim Rohn or Tony Robbins or, you know, some of these big speakers that would, you could literally see them have a conversation with somebody and within 10 minutes, there'd be this massive breakthrough. Right. And all of a sudden I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, that's not magic. What is that? 
Right. And that's when I began to learn about NLP, something called Neuro Linguistics Programming. And then I started to learn about hypnosis. And the understanding is that what they're doing is they're tapping into that subconscious, that unconscious mind, and having that conversation with the part of us that actually is able to have that change. Because most of us, we have a story that goes in the head and that says something like, oh, I'm not good at this. I can't do this. Uh, what if I should or what I could? Right. And we get so stuck in that that we don't actually make the changes. So what I did is began to learn, you know, how does this stuff work? Because I've always been interested in self-development. You know, it's, it's my own history has been, let's put it this way, to be where I am now. <laughs> right? Like, I, I love it. It's almost like one of those conversations where people in my past would look at me and be like, you did, you're doing what? <laughs> and then people who are with me now look back at my past and say, uh, <laughs> it's like two different people. And part of that is because I began to learn and understand that where we are in our circumstances right now doesn't necessarily have to be everything, right? right. Certain qualities of it we can use and some we can't. And I've been able to work with people. I've been so blessed with this all over the world. I mean, everything from, you know, hill tribe people in the, in the mountains of Thailand to federal agencies and to be able to work with people who want to make changes in their life, but not just something that's going to be temporary. Right. And when right. it comes to writing, what I love about working with Scott and the people that we've worked with already is that to watch somebody go from such fear, like shutting down fear to a freedom and then to bring back their smile once again. I mean, to work with some of the clients we have that I loved it. She was talking about how as a little girl, she just pictured riding these horses and then life happened. And now as she's coming up to retirement age, she's finally got her own horse and her own life and she's terrified of the horses. Right. But then all of a sudden now to see that breakthrough and then all of a sudden she's riding, enjoying and finding that freedom once again. Like that's just like I can't find a better purpose in being, right? Right. That, that's awesome. We have a really similar background on how, you know, like because I'm, I too am certified in hypnosis and NLP, mm -hmm. but I use it for, um, you know, my own personal purposes. I, I'm not a practitioner like you are, so I've not implemented it. But, you know, that's the path that we went through is like, We've done all the Tony Robbins stuff and, you know, I'm like a self-help junkie and, and right. so it's like, like, okay, there is a process to this. And yeah. I think that's really important for people to understand that through the emotional, because, you know, we get stuck in that sympathetic mode. Like, so, you know, we get stuck in sympathetic mode and it's instantaneous, mm -hmm. right? Like we can't, we don't have control over it when we go there. Um, but it is something that can be changed and it doesn't have to be a path and it doesn't right. have to be just suck it up and get back on because that's not going to do any, that's not going to do me any good. And it certainly isn't going to do my horse good. And I, I, you know, I think I've got enough, you know, I've had horses now long enough that, you know, the horse will do one of two things with that type of situation, either they're going to teach you something, <laughs> either they're going to teach you something, or they're going to babysit you. And unfortunately, there's more, you know, horses are our best teachers, right, Scott? Oh, yeah, absolutely. They tell us everything that we're doing wrong. <laughs> right, exactly. So there's not too many of the babysitters out there, but there's a heck of a lot of teachers out there. And so that's why I just like, I'm super excited about this. And so. Um, Look out people here, STEM's the best friends right here. The, between Nathan and Donna, this is, <laughs> this is, this was really Enjoy cool. Watching that, our, our podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, watching, watching you two talk was just, it, we were right before all this started was just, I, I know the three other people that were on, were just sitting here dumbfounded. What are you guys saying? <laughs> <laughs> But um, uh, with that being said, I did want to I did want to kind of talk about something that I I always find is really important that Nathan uh, you were kind of you kind of talked about a moment ago was talking about people's story and yeah. I always feel and tell me if I'm wrong but I always feel like that's one of the most important pieces of the puzzle here. Yeah, it really is that story that we tell ourselves, right? Like our entire life is 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 made up of the stories. But here's the thing we forget is that we're the author. Let's think about it for a moment, right? If um, w one of the biggest concerns, right? Most people, they come to the conversation is what if I fall off, right? But it's not just the fall. It's 
What if I fall off and I get hurt? What if I fall off and this happens? And then if I get hurt, then my family can't make any money. And this, you know, like all of these incredible things, it's big, massive story about what could happen outside of a fall. It's the what if game. Or yeah. what if you fall and then you get back up? That's the part that we forget. And we're so good. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I can be a gold medalist when it comes to catastrophizing things, right? It's, I stub my toe, it's like, oh no, what does that mean? Right? <laughs> <laughs> and if I don't keep that stuff in check, then that's where the difficulty comes in. And so we have to realize that that's the same situation when it comes to writing. If your story is I'm going to fall down and then this, you know, X, Y, Z is going to happen and you take this out all the way, here's what we got to understand about the mind. And this sounds a little funny, but it doesn't understand the difference between imagination and reality. Correct. Now, if I looked at you and I said, you're flying, you are really not flying right in this moment. But I've had people come into my office and you mentioned flying around them and next thing you know, hands are shaking, their face is flushing, they're breathing heavy. And like, there's no airplanes in my office. It's just, <laughs> right? But they're experiencing it. They're having a visceral physical reaction as if they're actually there in that moment. That's why for a lot of people, they're already feeling that before they ever get into the ring, before they're tacking up the horse the night before because they knew they're going to go out and ride with their friends. I and think so that's an important piece. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just saying, I think that's an important piece there, Nathan, just to just to really put a pin in it here is, is it happens that far in advance. That's what we don't always realize is it happens that far. It could be, it could be the night before hell, it could be a week before. Yeah. Because just the thought of, you know, putting ourselves in a certain situation will start to, to create all these thoughts, emotions uh, in our brain. Would you agree? Absolutely. And the thing is, your body begins to physically feel those things, right? Every thought you have sets off a chemical reaction within the mind, and it sends it throughout the entire body. And it begins to wire into your system before it's ever or even has happened. And that's what we got to realize is that lots of times we've hurt ourselves or had these worst case scenarios happen 50 times before you ever walked into the barn. And so if it works that way in the negative, what happens if we flip it on its head and actually use it for good? Like use your awesome mind for good rather than evil, right? <laughs> and that's kind of what we do through this process is we begin to look at those things. Now, part of the way that we work with folks, you know, whether I'm working in the office with clients. Uh-oh, he froze again. He did or, freeze again. No. Oh, wait. oh boy. We good now? Listen, we're good now. Keep going. You're okay. back. Maybe I just shouldn't move. <laughs> uh, part <laughs> and he's gone again. <laughs> do is, it, is when I'm working with somebody, it's twofold. I call it root and fruit. Froze up again? It is, okay. but uh, uh, there you go. You're back. Okay. Two ways that I look at it, I call it root and fruit. The fruit of something is I need tools and techniques. I need you know, things that I can do in the moment to help relieve the fear or to build the confidence. The other side of it is that's the root. We begin to dig in and figure out, okay, what is causing this thing? And the beauty of that is that it creates a more of a, I guess I, the term is loose, but like a, a holistic approach to it where it's, it's trying to bring all of these different elements because you're not just one thing, right? Even if you think about your own life and who you are, Maybe you're a mom, maybe you're a, you know, if, let's say if you're a mom, you're, you're, you could be a, uh, you're a daughter, you're maybe a sister, you're an aunt, you're a wife, you're all of these different roles that you play in life. And if you think that you're just one of those things, well, then you're selling yourself short. And if you think that you're just afraid to ride, then you're selling yourself short. There's something else going on there. And what we want to tap into is if, let's put it this way, if you're on this call right now, then there's something deep inside of you right now that says, hey, I want more than what I've been experiencing. And the reality of it all is that that is possible. But here's the good part. You don't have to do it by yourself. And that's where we come in together to begin to work that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's key here. And this is something, as I've traveled around and teaching, I've taught so many people um, that have their own story. But what's really interesting that I find is, you know, the people that I deal with a lot of times they'll have gone to so many different clinicians, trainers, instructors, and what ends up happening is 
you know, you're, you're going almost for the sense of saying, how can I train my horse to be, to get rid of a habit that scares me? And essentially the biggest piece that you're missing is realizing no matter who you go to, it's, it really doesn't matter what it is that you do. Most of it you might find will either only work a little or may not even work at all. And that's because there's one huge piece missing. And this is something where I have always known there to be an issue with, with my teaching is that there's always a, a, a kind of a hole missing. And that is what's up in your mind. If you are playing out a story that, that is making you emotional uh, and not being present with the horse 100%, that horse feels it. I think everyone on this call who's, who knows about horses knows that horses feed off of energy. You know if you're nervous, a horse is, is going to be nervous. We all know that. Um, the problem is you can't really fake it when you're trying to calm down. You know, you, you, you can try to say, fake it till you make it, but essentially the horse knows what's going on within. And if you can't change that, then you are essentially never going to change the habit that you're trying to fix overall with your horse. Too many times do we blame the horse for the problem that is from within us. And not only from within us, but then also from physically what we give to the horse. See, the horse is merely just perceiving information from us and reacting to what they think we want. And if we don't change how we communicate, we will never fix any habits. So it really all starts from within the prep, the prep work within your mind. And so Nathan, just a, a couple of things here that I, was, I would love for you to go over is what can people really start to do from the beginning before we even get to the barn, before we even, you know, when we wake up and know that we're going to go to the barn that day, what, can we do? Yeah. Well, and actually, when you we were mentioning that, it was kind of making me think of one of our clients, and I'll just make up a name. I'll give her, I'll call her Connie. Um, she had ridden this horse, and she had this, like, it was the perfect horse for her, and she had it, and it was just beautiful. She had this great ring. She had everything you could ask for, and yet, I think that something had happened, and she had just stopped riding, and a long time had gone between that, and what was interesting was as we were going through the process together, I asked her, what would, well, what I asked her kind of like, what's going on for you right now? And she talked about all the fear, the worry, the concern, what if this happened, like all of these terrible things we mentioned before. Um, but what was interesting though, is that I asked her, what, what would it be like if it was perfect? And one of the first things out of her mouth was, I can't even imagine. Now here's what I want you to get. That's not just a phrase when somebody says that, or if you're saying that, that's legit. She literally could not imagine a perfect ride. She could not imagine getting on the horse and having a good time and smiling and all of these wonderful things. All she could think about was the pain and the agony of it. And none of it ever happened. That's the thing that I want you to get. Like she fell off 50,000 times in her own mind and never happened. So one of the first things I had her do, this was the beginning of it, was I want you to begin. Let's play the game of what if. What if you had the perfect ride? What if you got on it and it was everything just worked the way that it was supposed to? And what that does is it begins to create a, it's called a neural pathway. It begins to create a new neural pathway within your own mind. And the beauty of that is it's something that can begin to grow. It's that first step in the door. So if you're finding yourself right now where you're locked up in fear, whatever it might be, whether it's in life and finances or relationships or, you know, weight or whatever it might be, what if you could get the results you want and become the person you want to be? That's the first step. So before you ever get in the ring, like I said before, how do we flip this on its head? Well, begin the process of visualizing yourself with the perfect ride. Uh, there was a, a research project, re gosh, five, 10 years ago now where they took these basketball players and they put them in something called a uh, fMRI, functional, functional, whatever machine. <laughs> you know what an MRI is? Basically an MRI, you get the picture of it, whereas a functional MRI, you get to see the video of the neurons and everything launching off inside the mind. So they stuck them in this thing and they used the process of visualization and hypnosis. They had three different groups. They had one group that didn't do anything because they were the control group. They had another group that, uh, that kept shooting, um, 
free throws for another two or three hours afterwards, so a little extra into it. And the third group literally just sat and visualized. Now, before we get into that, I want you to get this. People have probably heard the phrase, practice makes perfect. It doesn't. Perfect practice makes perfect. Now, what's interesting, though, is the guys that were shooting the, shooting the, three, the free throws, um, they had some that went in, some that didn't, right? They had all these other things that were there. But for the people who were spending time visualizing or using self-hypnosis, every single shot was absolutely perfect every single time. Now, when they stuck them into these machines, they saw the brain light up and it, it released into the body. The body was reacting as if they were actually doing it. So they were having a perfect practice every time throughout. So at the end, and I'm sure you understand why I said this, out of the entire group, the group that did the visualization did far better than the rest of them. Now that ties into this because if you begin to think about that perfect ride of what's my presence like when, I, when I'm with the horse, what's it going to be like when I get into the ring, what's it going to be like when I get into the saddle or begin to canter or tra trot or whatever it might be, that begins to create that neural pathway within your own mind. And the thing is, we can't feel, we don't necessarily feel two things at one time. So if you're focusing on the one area, if your brain is releasing all those wonderful chemicals that say confidence and power and uh, fun and excitement and all of those wonderful things, then fear and anxiety, it might pop up for a moment, but it's just the flash and the pan. Where and what we want to do, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Nathan, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just want to talk about just a point you just said, which was um, if when our brain is releasing all these things that, that, uh, that you know, expel, expel confidence, this is one thing that I want to make sure that you understand or, or you don't get confused about is that you're not trying to convince yourself to be confident. Correct. Because that is something, you know, like how many times uh, has, has anyone ever said, like when you're up in the saddle, has anyone said, you'll be fine. <laughs> you're going to do just fine. Just go. You're good. You know, it, no matter how many times somebody says that to you inside, you're like, no, I'm not. I'm really not going to be fine. This right. is going to go terrible. And so the biggest key to that, this comes back to that visualization. And I, I take it, I take it, the words I use a lot is just imagination. Yeah. Right? Same thing. Using that imagination. And so anyway, I just, I'm sorry to interrupt you on that one, yeah. but I, I was going that I thought that was important. Well, and that time of imagination or visualization or even self-hypnosis, it's all basically the same stuff. Just make sure that it's an allotted amount of time that you are working on that. And I want you to get to, this is not just positive thinking. Like I can't positive think myself into being a six foot tall basketball, you know, pro basketball player. It's just, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Right? Like no matter how, okay, it doesn't work. But if I begin to recognize going through the skill sets that it takes to do that, you know, maybe I never reach that level, but at least I'm going to qualify and better myself in those areas that lead up to that. So utilizing your mind in a way that is working for you rather than against. And kind of when I talked about that pathway too, um, it's something called neuroplasticity, which means that your brain is constantly reshaping and growing itself. Like it, it doesn't stop. You know, a long time ago, they, there was a belief that you're born with a certain amount of brain cells and you know, a certain way that your brain's wired and then, then that's it. That's, you know, good luck with it. You know, the old, the old phrase of, uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. We ain't dogs. <laughs> Our brain is constantly rewiring itself. And every single day you're learning new skills. Now with that, it's kind of like if you think of a path, let's just say a path in a field. The only way that you know it's a path is, a path is because it's been walked. It's a pathway. You've seen it ingrained. You can see it there. Well, it's kind of the same way with your own mind. If you want to create a new path, you're going to have to walk a new path. And it's going to be a while of treading that before you actually begin to see it. Now, what's exciting about that is that the old path of fear and worry and anxiety, that begins to eventually grow over. In the same way in your brain, it begins to atrophy. So that old fear, your brain can't access it like it does the new stuff of confidence, just simply because it's rewiring itself. Again, you are far more powerful than you can imagine. So any of these worries or concerns that you have, recognize them as a story, as an aspect of you, but it's not you. You're more than that. Wow. So with that being said, I think one of the really cool things <clears throat> that I remember when we first met Nathan that you said that really helped me just start to change my overall look on things was you can't hold more than one emotion at a time. 
Yeah. You cannot be afraid and be happy. You cannot be afraid and be angry. Ultimately, you knowing that changed everything for me and it may not change everything for everyone, but it changed everything for me because the moment that I started feeling fear, I recognize that fear as an emotion that I say, I need to figure out immediately how to change to a different emotion and the fear is just gone. Yeah. And that's powerful because what that does is it actually gives you, um, it's called disassociation. Right. If I'm associated into something, that means I'm feeling it. I'm experiencing it's everything I am in that moment. But if I disassociate from it, then all of a sudden now it's not just I am fearful. It's I am experiencing fear. And that little tiny gap right there offers you the opportunity to create a change. If I'm feeling that, well, then I can feel something else. And one thing that we want to get to, and we'll chat about this as well, especially when um, Scott's talking about your body positioning when you're in the saddle and those things, is that movement moves emotion. And I want you to get this too. Like people talk about this whole mind-body thing. Well, it's one thing, right? Like your brain doesn't stop here. It runs all the way through your system. So what we have to realize is that when we think something, our body's going to react to it. It's kind of like, (laughs) well, it's like I wouldn't look at you and be like this. I'm so happy today. This is so <laughs> wonderful to be here. Right? Like, in the same way, I wouldn't be like, boy, I feel terrible today. This is an awful day. Right? Like, it doesn't equate. It doesn't align. And so what we got to realize is that if you're finding yourself in that place where fear is beginning to take over, then get up, move your body, begin to do things that make you feel confident and powerful. And if one of those is practicing the way Scott's going to teach you how to sit in a saddle, then all of a sudden the confidence is going to begin to show up. Because here's what we got to realize about confidence. Confidence is always late to the party. Yeah, (laughs) it's true. Can I, Um, so one of the, I'm going to, can I jump in real quick here, guys? So um, I really like the, the perfect practice makes perfect. And, and Nathan, obviously being a geek with all of this, I saw <laughs> that study. I saw that study. <laughs> and, and, and so they were practicing in their mind being perfect. And, and then when they went out and performed it, it, it was almost perfect. It, yeah. You know, they had a, actually, I think, a better rate than the guys that had actually been practicing. So this is, and, and so I'm going to just, Scott, I think, well, what, either one of you can answer. So um, I experienced an injury in the saddle a couple years ago. It had nothing to do with my horse, and I did not fall off of my horse. Did not fall off of my horse. She did nothing wrong because my horse is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's a really good girl. Um, but I did have an injury, and so it's taken me a long time to get back in the saddle. And so several weeks ago i was back in the saddle and um so i was riding her and the rest of my herd that was outside of my arena decided that they needed to have a party (laughs) and i.e running around and running and bucking and just being crazy well my girl was really good for about three minutes and then she was like okay i i'm done being good here now I got off at that moment in time because, you know, right? Um, However, Scott, so I can write it, I can in my mind visualize and get prepared and be in that positive space. Would that technique also work? Because we're riding horses, right? We're riding a prey animal. It's if if we don't want to get hurt, we shouldn't have horses, <laughs> right? Right. You right. don't want to get bucked off. That, never no, get it's on. Not that, right. It's not that we want to get hurt, but like we're riding twelve hundred pound animals that have that are emotional creatures, and so you know we're at a different risk than somebody riding a four wheeler. And so, so my ahead, question to you is. For, for me, and I think everybody out there as well, should I be practicing perfectly in my mind 
what to do when those situations come up? The all important question, what to do when the fecal matter hits the oscillating blades, right? right. That's, the, that's the, key, the key question here. And so I kind of said this earlier that we were gonna talk about, which was being able to use your fear to your benefit. And what I mean by that, it comes right back to this imagination. One thing that I find or, or I feel, I personally feel that makes me the rider that I am and the communicator that I am with the horse is my imagination, but use it in this way. When something goes wrong or even if something isn't going wrong, constantly my brain is thinking of picking different options of what I'm doing depending upon the situation. If I pick option A, my imagination says this, this, or this could happen. If I pick option B, this, this, or this could happen. <clears throat> and so when I get through all the options, I then pick the right option, or you know, I pick an option and I commit to that option. <clears throat> and nine out of 10 times, thankfully now through my experience, um, I would say that that option is usually a, a, a most a, a correct one because how I know it's correct is I'm staying safe. And so safety is key here. Can you, can you imagine a perfect ride and then and, and it always go perfectly? Absolutely not. Because like Nathan's you know, talking about the study of a basketball, there's another element and that is the, the, the wild animal, if you will. <clears throat> and so the, in, in a sense, Donna, you went through those options within those three minutes and then you chose to get off to keep yourself safe and I will guarantee you you chose the right option yeah could you have done exercises in that time frame sure you could have tried some things and I'm sure you did try them and maybe they didn't work but is getting off always the right option I'm not saying that it is um, but I do think that you can use imagination in that instance and be able pardon me and be able to come up with the right answer. And yeah. what you do need to know is there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle to help you have broader options. Can I do this, this, or this? Because these are tools in my toolbox that I know have worked in the past. Can I try these? Maybe I'll try them. But if I do try them, do, um, for example, uh, let me just say it like this. Um, one of the big options people do is like a one rain stop, right? You ever done a one rain stop, Donna? Yep, absolutely. Okay, so a one rain stop for people who, you know, the horse starts building this emotion <laughs> in their brain. Let's say they're spooking at something or they wanna turn and face the herd of horses that are running. Generally speaking, a one rain stop does this. It turns their head away from what they're looking at or from what they're, they want to put that attention to. Generally speaking, does a horse immediately calm down or kind of swing around so that way they can try and turn and watch with their eyes. But then when they realize where they are standing now is their butt is now facing that way. So then they have to turn again and now their head has gone the other way. And it's just a bloody circle that you're going in. <laughs> right, well, and, and, and usually, usually I turn to face. Like that's how I was taught, like turn Absolutely. and face them so they can see what's going on doesn't work so well with saddlebreds because you know they can like put themselves yeah. into a pretzel. <laughs> Absolutely. And 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 my actual I, I actually have really gone away and I'm you know I might get chastised for this but it doesn't matter. I've really gone away from doing one rain stops um, because I find that there's far better things to to do. Turn and face is one of the best options in that situation. But let me just again going with that kind of idea. The point that I'm saying is if you think about that as your option, you choose that, or before you choose that, you need to think, play out in your mind. If your horse then does these spirals, because you know that that's what your horse does, what could happen if the adrenaline pumps more? If you're holding to the side, could the horse then get so panicked that he starts to pop up in the front end? Could the horse start backing up? Could the horse start doing all of these things that could lead to danger? Those are the imagination pieces that I'm kind of getting at, and you say, well, wait a minute, maybe a one rain stop is then not my best option. Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Thank and, you. And a big, a big part of what we're talking about too is, is twofold. One, this is the pregame stuff. 
This we is haven't even we haven't on. gotten in the saddle yet. <laughs> right? Like you're not I even know. at the barn yet, right? Like <laughs> this is stuff that happens the night before when you're thinking I'm gonna fall off and whatever. And this also the you know the perfect let me get this too. Visualizing perfection is for the person who can't even imagine getting on a horse. Yeah. Ah. The next level of that is after you got the perfection in your mind, everything's going all great all the time, right? Which we know isn't gonna happen because it's an animal, it's alive and the, you know, the environment changes. Now all of a sudden, just like Scott said, you begin to place scenarios in there with the distinction of not it ruining your ride in your life, but now you overcoming them. And yes. this is how you do it. And if you're utilizing the different skill sets of the training that Scott has and what you do, groundwork and the stuff that you're doing in the saddle, now all of a sudden, this is the best part. You have options. So I like me some options. Go ahead. I was saying, I like me some options. <laughs> you got to have them. You got to have them. I mean, one of the clients I worked with as well, she was at a competition. She had trained with this horse. Everything was fantastic. And for something, something occurred where she wasn't able to ride that horse. So she had to have a new horse. And now all of a sudden, what am I going to do about this? And for her to be able to recognize that that was the story of I can't to now I can, that began to change everything for her. So again, perfection first, obstacles overcome them, continue forward. Again, so free game. exactly. And because I know that all of us, the three of us will geek out for another three hours <laughs> on this. <Yes>. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to move it along to saying, okay, you've started to get that imagination of what perfection is. You're now at the barn. You're still in a good frame. You're getting in the saddle. What do you do now with your seat? And so I wanted to talk about this because one of the things that are really fast at being able to literally just kick you out of that positive, confident uh, mode that you're, you're in is really not having the stabilization, the unbalance in your seat because you are not in a place where you are centered in the horse. You are not fully connected. You are not engaged with your horse. And so one of the things that I wanted to, um, to really talk about here is when, when you are putting your foot in that stirrup, it really comes down to, and, and not just for your own confidence, but how the horse communicates with you or how you communicate with them rather, um, and how the horse literally just travels is all about you and not just your energy within. Nathan just went over all of the different uh, uh, thoughts of energy from within, but now let's talk about really how you can stabilize yourself in the saddle. So here's a couple of things. I want to share my screen here um, and share a video. Okay. Can everybody see? Can you see this, this uh, thing on here? Donna, can you see it? Yep. Okay, great. Okay. So let's talk about really quick. There's several different positions uh, that people have, and, and you know, I'm just going to kind of do a broad overview. Um, you have a lot of English people that get kind of this position of what I like to call duck butt. Um, and you get it where the, the rear end is farther out behind. If you look at the spine, I, can you guys see my cursor here or no? Yep. Okay, so if you look at this spine, how you have a hollowed out back right here, this hollowed out back, not to mention, is going to make the horse very hollowed out as well. This hollowed out back is going to impede on your mobility as a rider 100%. And then not to mention that, you're also going to be literally so far forward, your center of gravity is going to be so far forward that during any anything that goes wrong, your horse comes to a sudden stop, does a misstep, whatever, you are always going to be going where? Over towards the ear because your, your center of gravity is forward, okay? Now, with that being said, uh, from this position, you then have the next position here. If my little play button would go away. Um, you have this next position that we tend to see more in a Western rider where they're kind of sitting on the rear end, leaning back, feet are forward. And you think like a lot of people think, well, this is going to really give me that stability because I can put weight through my stirrups. I can brace down onto them. If the horse were to start bucking or start doing anything wrong, I can then have that ability to stay in the saddle. And you couldn't be farther from the truth because still your center of gravity is now farther back 
which is then going to always be behind the horse. You will never be with the horse. And with that in mind, you will never be able to communicate 100% effectively. So I wanted to talk about now how can we fix these issues here, okay? So the first thing here, I'm going to kind of show this rider and I'm going to pause it frequently here. Hopefully the video comes through uh, well here, but um, as I pause it, notice what I'm going to first do. I'm gonna show you what I'm, or tell you what I'm gonna do and then I'll play the video. I'm going to, to see with this rider if she can be stable and I've asked her to use all of her strength and her core, which if you've ever ridden in an instructor, maybe you've been told before you need to have an active core to ride. I'm going to show you today, you really, you really don't. You don't need a tight core to ride your horse and I'm gonna show you why. So I've asked this rider, there's no audio, it's just me talking, I've asked this rider to tighten from these two positions, tighten her core 100%, and then I'm gonna push on her from the front, and then I'm gonna push on her from, uh, from the back, and we're going to see how stable she is. So you see, it really took absolutely nothing for me to be able to push her, and there, <laughs> you can even see her smiling there, from there, it took absolutely nothing at all for me to be able to push her forward. So you had two different positions. Right? You had the one, again, where they're leaning back, and then two, where there's, she's sitting forward into the duck butt or the start of the Superman position, where it took nothing at all for me to shove her out of the saddle. All of her weight and center of gravity is up high. So can you imagine right now, even just at a standstill, how you could easily lack that confidence if a horse were to take a misstep? of any kind, if the horse were to trip, if the horse were to get a little spooked, and you can easily just like that be coming off the horse. And immediately your mind is going to go in a negative place. So stability is everything, okay? Now, with that being said, let's start talking about how do we fix this, okay? How do we put ourselves in the right position here? So, let me just kind of bring it back up. Okay, so the first thing, we're gonna separate this into three different parts. The first part and the most important part, the thing that's going to get her stable right from the beginning is to be able to work on her midsection, okay? And what we wanna focus in on is the pelvis and make it more simple, we'll talk about the seat bones. What are the seat bones? To make it even more simple, is those pointy little things at the bottom of your butt that hurt when you're in the saddle for a very long time. Now, with that in mind, we need to think about the angle of those seat bones. We do not want our seat bones coming back behind us, which would be putting tilting our pelvis forward. We do not want those seat bones to be going forward, which will be tilting our pelvis backward. We want our seat bones to be going directly straight down into the saddle. But you might be wondering, how can you get there? How do you get your seat bones directly down into the saddle. Well, here's a really good trick for you to try next time you're in the, in the saddle. Take both feet out of the stirrups, put your hands in front of you, and I want you to bring your knees up to your hands, just like she's about to show right here. So we're going to bring our hands in front and bring our knees right, uh, right up to our hands. And now our pelvis is in just our pelvis, not the rest of her body, of course. I don't want you to ride like this. <laughs> Um, just the pelvis is in a correct position. She can feel the seat bones going down. So then what I ask her to do is I ask her to put her feet all the way back down, but not into the stirrup, just let them hang. Uh-oh, let me, let me do this again. Hold on, I lost it, I hit the wrong button. Nope, can't, there it is, okay. So I asked her to put her feet all the way back down here. Now. Once she does this, her pelvis is in the right spot. However, what the next piece of the puzzle for the midsection is understanding our lower back. Too many times, like think about it now as you're sitting there. If I asked you to do what your mother taught you to do when sitting at the table and sit up tall, what does it do to your back? You sit up, you stick your chest out, you hollow out your lower back and immediately all of your center of gravity is directly up front. And so what we wanna do is we want to really take that hollowed out back and we want to fill in the lower back. So here's a really great exercise to try is to talk about breathing. 
what I want you to do is take a nice deep breath, but when you do it, recognize that most of the time when you do it, it comes from the chest. Of course, our lungs are in the chest, so immediately that's where it's gonna come from. But what I'd rather you do is try to fill up your, your stomach as full as you can and kind of think about belly breathing. Do what society tells us not to do and really stick that stomach out. And when you do that, as you let that breath out, as you'll see, I'm gonna put my hand on her lower back. I asked her to fill in her lower back into my hand, okay? So she is rounding her shoulders, yes, but we're gonna get to all of that in just a moment. So she's, she's filling into my hand here with her lower back, her pelvis is still in a good position. She still is leaning almost a little too far back here. But as I do this, now watch what I'm about to do is I'm gonna push on her lower back. And here's what I want you to really focus in on. What moves, what moves? Is it her? Or is it the horse? Did everybody see that? Hold on, I'm gonna back it up. When I push on her, what moves? Did you see that? The horse moved, not the rider. She was not tensing and tightening up of the legs. She was not tensing and tightening up of her core. She was just in a position that made her body stable. And that's how simple it can be just from the pelvis. And that's just one piece of the puzzle. We got two others. I said three. I don't know why I said three. Um, we have two other pieces of the puzzle to talk about. But now we have that stability. So what's next in the second piece of the puzzle that we need to talk about is her upper body, right? She's rolling those shoulders forward. How many of us have um, this bad posture? This is something that even trainers have really, you know, we have those, that trainer's hunch. Uh, we roll the shoulders forward. We lean forward with this. It's a really bad habit and really detrimental to our horse as well. And so even here is rolling her shoulders back. So here's what, you, here's what we do to solve this problem. We take her shoulders and we ask her to pinch her shoulder blades back, hold for about three seconds. Now during this time, she's probably going to hollow out the back. So mind you, when we fix one thing and we try to work on another, we might we might have to go back and forth as we do this, but I'm gonna ask her to hop, to pinch her shoulder blades back like this. And as she pinches, holding this here for about three to five seconds, I'm going to then ask her to literally just release. Now, just from that, notice the roll of her shoulder is almost fully gone. And that's just from one little piece. And she's not actively trying to hold her shoulders back. How many, of you time, how many times have you guys ever ridden under an instructor or somebody ever told you, you know, sit up straight, hold those shoulders back. And when you do it, you're literally concentrating on it. You almost can't think of anything else. So with this being said, what we start to do is we get those shoulders back. The next piece of the puzzle here is to be able to then work on her, uh, uh, how her head comes out of her uh, neck there. So notice what she did right there was I asked her to pull her chin back directly straight back, hold for about those three seconds and then let go. And if you notice where she let go, her head is now in a much better position. So we're going to ask her to fill out her lower back again and then I'm going to push again. She's still very stable. Now the last thing that we're going to work on so I don't take up too much more time here talking is I noticed, notice I just shifted, uh, I just shifted her leg and when I'm shifting her leg, I'm rotating her pelvis back in here and her hip flexors a little bit in. A lot of us ride with our toes out. Have you ever been told riding with, your, you know, turn your toes in. The more you try to turn your toes in, the more your, your, uh, your legs hurt. Really, your toes are out because your pelvis is open. So I say, take the back of your thigh, pull it out and rotate the pelvis. That's what she's doing right, or what I'm making her do right there. Then what I'm asking her to do here is I'm going to ask her to wiggle her toes, keep her ankle loose, and push down and back into my hand, which you can't see very well because of my thing. Um, push down and back as far as she can with her hip flexor. So that way it pulls her leg farther back. I bring from the knee her feet back into the stirrup. Shift her leg just a little bit. Tell her to push, put weight through her back. And I'm going to push and she's in whoop, a much better position. Now, from that, from that right there, there. From that right there, we're gonna now just quickly go over, because I'm taking up a lot of time, quickly go over then the connection of what's important. 
the only way that you can get true movement with your body is to have this position because so many times the next time you ride here's how you can tell whether you're in the right position how freed up are you through your hips are you able to actually move flowingly with the horse if you are in that duck butt position where your your seat bones are out behind you what you're going to notice is that you physically can't actually move forward with your position or with your hips you only can go backwards with the horse so if you notice this right here, this part of the video, she's really focused on driving through her seat and being connected through the horse's, uh, through the horse's rear end right here. And this right here, that movement is going to not only get her better communication, and we can go a lot more in depth, I geek out on this part a heck of a lot more, but this will instantly get to that stable seat. And if the horse starts to travel or move in a direction um, that is not wanted, she is much better off or more likely to stay stable in that saddle. So with that being said, I know I sometimes geek out on that uh, and my apologies for taking quite some time with that, but um, this is one of the most important things. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing this here. Now, if for some, for some reason uh, people want to see this video, uh, it's just a, uh, a quick, easy video, um, but if people want to see this video again, we'd be happy to send it to you. And if you want to, uh, you can either uh, put the, your email in the chat box or email us to, you know, to, to, for us to send it to you. We would be happy to do that. Uh, no charge or anything like that. We'd be happy to send you uh, this video. So um, with that kind of being said, these are the major pieces of the puzzle. It shouldn't be just talking about your body, because your body can only do so much. But if you unlock your mind, like Nathan was talking about, which Nathan is still muted, uh, in case you didn't realize that, Nathan. <laughs> um, if you unlock your mind, you can then get to a place where you can truly connect with the horse one-on-one. -on -one. Nathan, have you figured out how to unmute yourself, by the way, buddy? It's in the lower left-hand corner. It says should say unmute. Oh. And um, You'll unlock him. Uh, Alex, <laughs> can you unlock Nathan, please? <laughs> we really didn't want to hear from you again, Nathan. This was my subtle way of saying no. stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. There, there we go. Okay. I'm sitting there. I'm like, it says the host locked me. And I'm like, okay. Wow. <laughs> See, I sent her a message on on Instagram. I said, just <laughs> shut him up. <laughs> right. Um, um wow you guys like holy smoke that, that that like you both provided so much information and what i loved were strategies that um my audience can actually go implement like right now today yeah like, well and it is tip of the iceberg stuff though that's the only part like uh, when we do workshops, I mean, it's like it's great because we do them as a group but then you also get individual and then you actually get in the ring as well so it's this you know it's this approach where the whole mind body everything's in it so yeah right absolutely and so um also just so everybody knows we will be uh we will be sending out a recording of this so you'll also be you'll be able to access oh, yeah, the entire it. component of it as well and we will also be sure to put in contact information for scott and for nathan um, so that if you can reach them directly. But I'm not closing up yet because we haven't gotten to Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> and before we do that, I, I did want to just mention one thing. Um, and, you know, we talked about in the, in the private and group sessions, something that um, I don't, you know, many people don't know is that Nathan and I, during this hard time, we have... We heard, Nathan and I have been putting together a program before COVID-19 happened, putting a program together to, to try to help people from home, try to get over these things and doing it kind of every step of the way. But um, it, we, were not, we weren't done yet, but we decided that we would like to put a class together. Um, and Donna, I wanted to tell you about this because we're not only putting this class together, it's very limited. I think we'd see the 20, 30 spots that we're doing, but it goes more in depth than pardon me, than what we just did here. And for your audience, we're giving a major discount on it. If anyone would like to sign up for it, um, it is a course, a class that we're doing on 
hold on, I'm losing the date, uh, May 23rd. It is a, another Zoom type class, but we're gonna go even more in depth. And we are giving uh, a discount on this uh, for only $49 that we can really try to help. See, like right now, if you have so many people on, right, we can't really help and understand their story. We wanna try to help people a little bit more in depth if we can. And so we're putting on this, this, uh, this class. We would love for people to join um, and uh, um, if anybody's available. And if you can't join you know, live, we certainly send the recording to, to you as well. But of course, you can get even more out of it by asking questions and being a part of the story uh, as we do it. So that's something that we are offering. Um, and Allie, um, who is not, who's on live, but you can't see her, she's gonna be posting a link in the chat room for people to be able to go and sign up for that. Um, but if you, you'd have to do it here pretty soon because we'll be putting it back to the regular price here soon. So hopefully you guys uh, will be able to, um, uh, to join us for that. Awesome. Yeah. And if you are interested in individual coaching, that's available as well. Um, you know, this, my websites are there. Scott's going to have his. So it is a chance to, because I work with a lot of folks literally all over the world. Um, and a lot of this stuff is kind of digging in and figuring out, okay, what's going on? Again, you're more than your story. And as you begin to recognize that, anything and all things are possible. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I, I know that I'm going to sign up because, you know, it's just um, we've had other people have, have stories. And all of my injuries, ironically, have happened on the ground. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing. Um, but but and, and, I, and I, I, I shouldn't say that because I've, I, I've only, I've been blessed. I've had horses for 24 years and I've only been injured um, like three times. Mm -hmm. So um, so mine has more to do with, you know, the story that other people told me, you know? Yeah, and, yeah probably and, the what if. Right, well, and if you start, you know, like, so it was, you know, trail riding, trail riding, you know, that's all Brian and I did for like the first, first part of our riding experience was we would go try, trail riding in the woods of Wisconsin every weekend. Nobody told us that that was considered the most dangerous sport <laughs> horses, you know? And so then when we started taking more lessons and, and getting involved in, you know, more programs, you know, everybody kept saying, oh my God, you guys are trail riders? Oh my yeah. God, that's so scary, that's so scary. And I know how the brain works now, now, not right. back then. Right. And so I know that my brain got rewired to don't go trail riding because it's really dangerous. That's it. Yeah. And um, and so it's just amazing how our brain does that without us knowing it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and the thing too is that it always it 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 makes really quick connections and associations. Yeah. That. Again, if you were sitting there thinking, okay, now I'm going to go take this workshop to make me a better writer, but I'm going to come back more, more, more fearful, right? <laughs> it wouldn't have been the case. It's right. just we have to realize that because it makes us associations, we have to, if we recognize we're going one direction, we got to yeah. rein it in, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I love, Scott, the correlation, like just the foundation of if you've got a rock solid seat, you're not going to, you know, minimizing those bobbles and those off balance because that can you know i i have a a friend that she was riding and the horse got a little scared and a little up and she's a very seasoned rider she went right into sympathetic mode froze and literally somebody had to come take her off the horse because she just and so being able to go, oh, wait a minute. Now, if she wouldn't have had that experience, if she would have had that rock solid seat, you know, she could have, you, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda, but, you know, my brain just goes like, that's a great tool to have. That's a great foundation to be able to have that. And, and as a strategy, in addition to the, you know, the what if strategy and the visualization. So um, it's already 512. I just want to take their, um, there were a couple, several scenarios that people have gotten injured on the horse. Um, 
There have been several scenarios. But, so this is a really interesting one that I would like you guys to answer. Um, it says, uh, I have a, uh, my question is from Hannah Mari. And um, it, sh it says, my question is about a frustrating phenomenon where I am fine in the situation when things are happening. The horse bucks, trips and falls, spook. I feel calm and in the moment, just focusing on the best action. However, a little while afterwards, I start becoming anxious about whether I can handle the situation if it happens again. It is unfortunate because the actual history shows that things can go well, but I still get anxiety about it. Nathan, I'm going to let you take that one, buddy. Sure. Um, so a couple of things to look at. It's kind of like um, our body's going to react a certain way. Like that's, that's just the reality to it, right? If it's a scary situation, your body's supposed to act that way, right? Fight, flight, freeze kicks in on purpose because that's the instinct. You don't want that stuff to go away because one of the things that Scott will say too is that if you don't have any fear at all, then you're reckless. And that's even more dangerous than if you were scared. So that feeling that happens afterwards, begin to embrace it. And I know that sounds really, really odd, but I'll say this, like I've, I've done public speaking and I've spoken everything from, you know, groups of 500 people to literally 2000 or 10,000 people in a, in a stadium. And with that, there's been times years now that I've been doing this stuff for decades that before I go on stage, I'm sitting there and I'm like, can, can anybody else hear my heart beating? Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, is that the drums or is that me? <laughs> right? And because of that, that's a natural physical reaction. The difference though, is I flip the meaning of it. It doesn't mean that I can't. Does it mean that sometimes I get up there and all of a sudden my breath gets shaky and my hands and whatever? Yeah, but after about 30 seconds, that stuff goes right away. And afterwards, your body is still gonna release those chemicals into the system because it's still part of that adrenaline rush. And if, that, if and when that happens, cool. Make it something where it doesn't have the meaning of, oh no, I can't. Turn it into the meaning of, yeah, I did, and I'm awesome, right? <laughs> right? Like, and it's almost like when you're gonna go for a roller coaster ride, right? right? Like there's fear that's there, but that's that fear that's like, I'm gonna do something fun and this is gonna work out. Well, you've already conquered the mountain, so good on you. Just shift the perspective and recognize you got this. And something to add to that uh, a little bit more is even in that moment, in that situation, one of the things Nathan even said earlier is understanding movement and how, you know, if you're just sitting there locked up, you're going to build even more. So get up and move, right? Well, this then brings back to the practical uh, use of the stable seat. Because if you noticed in that ending part of the video where the girl was walking and really moving with the horse, that movement can be just enough for you to start to think, let's drive, let's move our feet, but in a positive way. That doesn't mean go run and do you know, all that stuff, but really start to say, I'm helping this horse every step of the way. In the moment that you start to even see that the, that the option could turn in the direction that's negative, you, are, you, you need to at that moment to really even drive more, more movement, because the more unlocked the horse's body is, the more unlocked the horse's brain is or the calmer the horse will then become. Now, I don't want to necessarily go into so grave in depth on, on how to calm the horse down necessarily, but that's one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle because the moment you shut down, your horse doesn't want to actually be against you in the tempo and the rhythm that you provide. And if you're providing a shut down locked uh, midsection, you will always then shut down the horse. And if you don't shut down the horse, I mean, in a sense, you always will. But if the horse is still then moving, then the horse is completely disconnected with you and then gives the horse a bigger uh, reason to get distracted into all the other stimuluses out there, whether you're trail riding, you're going on, you know, you're, you're in the arena, whatever it is. You need, too many people are thinking that it's just, you, you sit there and you, and you just go have, have a ball. And while that has its place, you generally need to realize that you need to ride every stride. You need to be there for your horse all the time. This is no different than the car that you drive. If you literally are behind the wheel and just say, Jesus, take the wheel, then you know where you're going to end up. 
And the horse is the same way. You have to be there every step of the way. And so- I love that. I, so I love that. And I love that you guys touched on something and I just had a big aha. So you touched on something about the fear in the movement and you have to move through it. And so Tony Robbins, if anybody's ever been to a Tony Robbins event, this is my big aha that I just have. Tony will make you sit down and, and write down like all of your biggest fears. He'll make you write down like all of your biggest dreams, which can be really scary. And then he cranks up the music so loud that you can't hear yourself even think and you have, you have to get up and dance and you have to move. So I was like, now I understand why he does that. Yep, yep. yep. And that's, that's also, that adds in too, the confidence always shows up late. Right? Yeah. Like that's the confidence shows after you've done that 50 times, right? <laughs> like if she's experiencing that, okay, cool. You've made it through every single time. You've all of those worst days. Right. Done, <laughs> right. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask one question and I know that we're out of time, but can like, can we just, just talk about one more thing because it's come up a couple times. Um, so we had, uh, Susan Hilton, who is a great client of ours. She took an online course last year called Fearless Writing, um, NLP, and she said it helped her where she didn't get nervous going to the barn, getting on her horse, like they helped her through that. The problem is she just can't ride some places on the farm, and she also gets very nervous when other riders are riding the trot or canter around her, and she just freezes and she'll just usually get off and walk her horse back to the barn. Um, Does, and not, not to interrupt, but is there any way that we can get the answer to this question? Is the horse nervous as well? Is that what stemmed her to be nervous? I mean, actually, I think the stemming was far, far previous from that. But is that initially what sets off the, the, the fireworks in the mind? Is it because there's certain parts the horse gets nervous too? Or is it just previous experiences, I guess that would be, that would help me a little bit to- Well, to and I'm, I'm well. gonna go, I'm gonna segue in um, Anita Hall. Um, she wants to, so let's just go from the, Anita says, advice for when you need to shut out negative, nervous, other riders around you, and you cannot get away from them in that situation. Their fear makes it tough to be confident. So, um, let's go from that premise because I know that, you know, like when I'm around, well, like, you know, like when you're trail riding or something and somebody comes cantering up behind you and your horse is like, Whoa, what's going on? Like, yeah. how do we so, do, what do we do within our own body? So I think what I'll start with this and Nathan, you can, you can come in if you hear anything that you want to add to. I think what's important here is understanding being in your own space, being in your own world. Too many times are we in our own world at the wrong times. <laughs> we need to be in our own world with our horse all the time when we're around it. In fact, we need to literally isolate out everything else that's going on and focus just with our horse. And when the horse has some kind of spaz attack or some kind of issue, the biggest thing that you need to think about is I am here for you talking to the horse. I am here for you. Let me help you understand that I'm relaxed. Let's go have some fun and let's keep moving. Because here's the problem is it's a snowball effect, right? Your horse hears the cantering, maybe most likely before you do. You, the, horse, the, uh, the horse coming up behind is becoming louder and louder towards you. Your horse starts to react just a little bit. And then you recognize what's happening, you hear it, the adrenaline starts to pump within your own mind, you start to tense and tighten, then your horse says, holy crap, she's tightening, now I need to tighten, and the snowball gets bigger and bigger until the horse is finally gone. And at that point though, your horse has already exploded. And so with that in mind, you need to stop the snowball before it happens. Okay, now there are things that you can do to kind of help your horse, yes, get over other horses in the arena. There are exercises that you can do, but that's kind of, that's not exactly what we're, we're discussing here today. We're right. discussing what to do with yourself, uh, essentially. And so 
you need, and, and Nathan, you can correct me if I'm wrong or if you have anything to add with this, but you need to be in your own world in a sense that you drown out everything else. And when you can start to try to do that, when your horse takes that first nervous step that says, you know, things aren't going right, you need to be the calming voice of the, t of the herd. And if you're not, it will always end up um, bad. It, it, there's no option for it to get better, if that yeah. makes sense. That's, and, and it's a great way to put it. The other th side of it too, and I work with a lot of military folks because of where, I'm, where we're located, uh, I'm just about an hour outside of DC, uh, a couple of military bases. So I've worked with some of the secret ninja squirrels and that kind of folks. And these are people who are in incredibly intense situations. And it sounds odd and it sounds funny and it might even sound ridiculous, but that's exactly what I want you to do is I want you to make those situations ridiculous. You've already ridden horses. You know what to do. Like, I don't need to sit here and explain to you how to get on the horse, what to do, and all these, these other things. You already know that stuff. It's wired into your system, assuming that this is not your very first ride. The only difference in that circumstance is the meaning and the, the, the associations that you're creating in your own mind. So what we got to recognize in that is begin to make those situations ridiculous or funny or light. Because when somebody comes into my office, and I've dealt with some hardcore, painful stuff with people over the past that have gone through stuff I would wish them a worst enemy. But Why are you talking about my session with you, Nathan? <laughs> <laughs> right. But if that's the only place that I see them, because that's the only place they see themselves, then it's going to be really difficult to, to pull out or to, to dig out of that pit. So what we got to begin to do is create a little levity, even in the toughness. And with that, if you're in that ride and you got all this other stuff that's happening around you, I know it sounds really silly, but put a smile on your face or bring up a chuckle or, or you know, either there's Enjoy a it. I, go ahead. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Like that's why you're on the horse in the first place. The chances are nobody's making you do, go there, but we make it into this difficult, powerful, overwhelming, painful thing. And you're doing it for fun. So remind yourself of that constantly. One of the biggest things I have people like after we do our sessions and we go back and work with Scott in the ring, I look at him and I say, where's the smile? And just that right there makes such a massive, of difference oh my gosh you have the opportunity to ride a horse and to have fun and do these amazing things and we forget it this blessing becomes a burden flip it on its head bring back the excitement and joy of it and that makes a and difference I, and it will translate to the horse as well yeah i want to add one more thing to that which i think is is, is a good segue to this is is all the things that we have learned that you have learned through the years from different people, watching videos, learning from, uh, you know, in hand things, you know, in person things. Too many times do we go out there and we start to think about things so much that we're overthinking. Even though I can't see you right now, raise your hand if you think that you overthink everything that you do in the saddle because I can almost guarantee that every single one of you overthinks instead of doing something that, they should, that you should do, just ride. By the way, I have a t-shirt for sale that says, don't overthink, just ride in my store, 29, no, anyway. Maybe, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not lying necessarily about the t-shirt for sale, but <laughs> the point is, the point is, is that we need to stop thinking so much and just go out there and remember why we got into this in the first place. Yeah. And do you, do you know that there has been so many times that someone's homework from like a lesson or a clinic or, or whatever, a workshop, that I will literally, they'll say, all right, I'm ready to write down everything that I need to do. And it's just three words. Just have fun. That's it. Just we need to remember that. We yes. need to get out of our own minds. And there are so many times that I tell people, literally this, I'll halfway through a clinic, I'll say, now, you know what I've taught you in the last two days? You know, every piece of intricate and in piece of information there. I want you to take that. I want you to put it back in the subconscious and I want you to let it go and just do because you know it. You just are in your own way. And that y'all, I have had so much fun. I think 
that the three of us could probably go on for another whole, <laughs> whole three days, right? Um, because it, it's two topics that I love, horses and, and you know, your brain and rewiring the brain. And, um, and you're right, like, we got into horses for fun. And then, you know, stuff happens and it becomes not fun. And so I think everybody that signed up or showed up here today is they want to get back to that fun point. Um, and so I am so grateful that you guys uh, showed up, gave a thousand percent, gave um, some really great strategies for the audience to implement. And also um, your amazingly generous offer on the 23rd. I, I'm still in shock over that because um, this information is so valuable. And um, so for $49 and, and I don't say it and my, my people know me like I don't sales pitch and I don't, you know, I don't do that stuff, but come on y'all $49. <laughs> um, so I will definitely, I will definitely be there and um, we will definitely uh, include that link for them to sign up and so Scott, um, is there a, like a deadline date or is it once you get to 30, that's the cutoff and that's it? Uh, well, it, it depends on the, on, you know, we were, we were initially, we were literally just about going to be advertising it on our normal social media fan pages and stuff like that. We were going to give it um, about uh, a day, um, uh, like till tomorrow for, for this group before we advertised it for others. And if we get an overwhelming response, which I hope we do, we'll be putting on another day for um, for the rest of, you know, for everyone else. Um, yeah. So it really just depends on the response that we get. And we hope to be able to see everybody there because, I mean, let's be honest, we've all had fear. And if we haven't, then, then well, I don't know why the hell you're even here. <laughs> right. Exactly. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, thank you, audience, for joining us. And um and asking such great questions and showing up and the acknowledgement that we've got fear is a huge step to, to begin with. And Nathan, so happy to meet you. And I oh, here comes the best to more conversations. <laughs> I'm done. I'm getting off this call now because these two are just going to keep going. <laughs> oh. So. Yeah, I, I absolutely adore this stuff. And I, I love the opportunity to, to integrate it into this. Again, there's so many different aspects that this stuff works in. I mean, our minds are mind no matter where we are, right? Right. <laughs> so to, to be absolutely. able to utilize it best. I mean, that's powerful. Take back absolutely. control. That's what this absolutely. is about. Yeah. Well, I'm super excited. Um, I'm going to go home and I'm going to implement all of the strategy strategies truly like Scott literally my trainer was here at two o'clock. And so I'm like, okay, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. And she's like, you're gonna ride next week, right? <laughs> so I am going to ride next week, but I am going to implement, implement before I get to that point. So um, awesome. thank you guys. Thank awesome, you. you're very welcome. It was a great thank time you. seeing everybody and, and, uh, and talking with you all. Thank you.